The Goal of Education at Eglon, 3 July 1973. Some of you probably, without thinking too much about it, will have assumed that the goal of education is the acquisition of a body of knowledge, which will enable you to pass examinations set by universities. You believe that success in these examinations may enable you to learn a better living and make more money so that you can satisfy your physical needs and desires. While we agree that the ability to earn a good living is a necessary and important accomplishment, we do not regard this as the goal of education, but merely a byproduct of it. We believe that the goal of education is the development of the spiritual man. That is, of that part of each one of us which, with development and training, is capable of direct apprehension of the purpose of life the true nature of ourselves, of the world in which we live. If we are able to achieve such illumination, the business of everyday life and its problems will take care of themselves, and such physical wealth as we may need for our passage through this life will follow the spiritual wealth which we have worked to achieve. Hence, Although we can and do and should work to equip ourselves as efficiently as possible with the tools necessary for earning our living, we shall do this with the more success and at the same time achieve for ourselves lasting happiness and peace of mind if we set as our primary goal the acquisition of spiritual wealth or the development of the spiritual man. The organization of any school should therefore recognize this goal and contribute towards its achievement. So if an educator is to have any success in the accomplishment of his mission, he must take into account not only the development of the spiritual man, but also the nature of man and the practical means that may help him towards his goal. Now man's nature is complex, but it can be divided into four main aspects, each which influences and reacts to all the others. They are physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. Each of these four main aspects, if well nourished, can help us to develop our spiritual side, help us to perceive truth, to identify with cosmic intelligence, cosmic energy, creative principle, or the ultimate God according as you like to describe it. It is the ultimate destiny of us all and the reason and purpose of our lives here on earth. It follows that any education which helps prepare man to fulfill the purpose of his life on earth must nourish and exercise all four aspects of his nature. The joy and happiness which all men seek can be attained only in this way. This is the path to self-realization. All other satisfactions are either a means to this end or a mistaken attempt to attain happiness by concentrating on one or perhaps two of these aspects and neglecting the others. This results in imbalance and disharmony and disease. So, how in a school do we set about this task? Very little of what we do at Aiglon is haphazard, or done because other people do it, or somebody said it ought to be done that way. Everything we do has been carefully thought out and developed from first principles, and whenever new problems or questions arise, we seek their solution within the same context. We ask ourselves, is the solution proposed consistent with our basic aims and principles? Since this point is not always well understood by those associated with the school, it is perhaps worth giving a few examples of how it works out in our practice here. For example, we start from the premise that the body is the temple of the spirit. This can be stated in different ways. It is the house which we inhabit during the so short span of our life on earth. It is not us. It is an instrument which we use to express the various aspects of truth as we perceive them. 
therefore the more perfect the body is as an instrument in this purpose, the greater will its contribution be towards the attainment of our goal. We should learn to care for it, nourish it, and exercise it in a way which will help it to function in the best way possible. So we have morning PT, physical training. This should be a few minutes gentle jog or the equivalent to stimulate the circulation of blood after a night of relative stagnation. It may carry away for elimination some of the toxins accumulated during rest and circulate fresh oxygen from the lungs in the body to help keep the cells in optimum condition. Then we have the cold shower. The skin is one of the major organs of elimination of toxic wastes from the body and also ask, acts as a thermostat or controller of the body temperature. To fulfill these tasks, the skin must be kept in top condition owing to the artificial kind of life that man leads today and the clothes he wears, the skin does not have the constant practice of having to respond to forces of nature such as heat, cold, and wet, in which more primitive societies kept skin healthy. It is necessary to do this deliberately, hence the cold shower to stimulate the operation of the thermostat for the control of body temperature, to stimulate the irrigation of the glandular and lymphatic systems, and to stimulate the circulation of the blood. With regard to sports, games, and expeditions, because of their value in developing and training different aspects of the character, and body and the maintenance of health, every student is required, unless some medical reason prevents it, to take part in at least one team game, ski during the winter and take part in ski expeditions, take part in expeditions on foot when snow and climatic conditions permit, and follow a course of gymnastics appropriate to his ability. These physical activities contribute to the intellectual, emotional, and spiritual development of the student. Intelligence is required to perform physical activities well. Considerable emotional satisfaction can also be had from them, from the physical pleasure of doing, as well as from the satisfaction derived from successful performance and from companionship with and service to others. Contact with nature also makes their con contribution to the spiritual development of the individual. Now, food and drink. Owing to the bad feeding habits of modern civilization and the falsifying of natural instinct, it is very difficult to handle correctly, apart from the difficulty of finding good produce and cooks who understand what is required and are willing to carry out the policy. Ideally, all raw materials for meals should be fresh and grown without the use of pesticides and chemical fertilizers. They should be eaten raw where possible or conservatively cooked to preserve the maximum amount of nutrition, especially vitamins, mineral salts, and trace elements. All refined foods such as white bread, white rice, white sugar and anything made with or containing them should be eliminated from the diet as well as toxic materials, alcohol including wine and beer and soft and carbonated drinks all which contain sugar or chemical compounds of various kinds. Efforts should be made to dissuade students from absorbing these things and candying and chewing gum between meals and when not in the school since most children are brought up to value those unhealthy substances, the task is not an easy one. A pure bloodstream is the greatest defense against disease, both of the body and of mind.